How's it going, guys? Uh, a friend of mine got in contact very recently and just let me know about a telescope coming out that I wasn't actually aware of yet, and it is the William Optics Mini Cat. Now, it looks like a beautiful little telescope, I have to say. Um, it is pricey. It's coming in at $900. But the thing that he actually got in contact about to point out to me is uh, the fact that they, it's coming with a very interesting little disclaimer. Now, I don't want to paint this as something that's hidden because it's not. William Optics, uh, if you're going to do this, they've gone about it the complete right way. In my mind, it's not kind of hidden away. It's mentioned right here at the top of the page that if you want to get the best out of this thing, they recommend using Blur Exterminator or, you know, similar. Get the absolute best from their scope, which I'm in two minds about, basically. <laughs> now, I, I, I can absolutely make an argument for the fact that if you're in astrophotography deep enough to the point where you're looking at spending $900 on a wide field refractor, I'd say you're probably, you're in, up to your neck in astrophotography. You likely are already going to have Pixing Sight and Blur Exterminator, Noise Exterminator, etc. All the tools. Do you know what I mean? Um, that it would seem like it follows almost to me that, you know, if you're in that deep, you're probably going to have all the best tools as well. Equally, I really don't think it's a good thing <laughs> in any way um, that a $900 telescope should have to rely to get the best out of it, you know, on software, um, especially software that, you know, that's not included with the scope as such. Um, it's an odd one. So let's talk about it a little bit more. I'll just read you, of course, in case, you know, you're driving or something and just listening to this. For perfectionists in astrophotography, we recommend using Blur Exterminator software after stacking your images to achieve flawless correction of peripheral star points. That's written right there at the bottom of their main uh, like blurb about this telescope. Now, it's an f3.5 scope, so it's quite fast at 51mm aperture, uh, I think 178mm focal length. So it's, you know, it's wide, it's fast. It's an interesting scope overall. Now, um, their spot diagrams, if we just uh, try and take a look at these in another tab real quick. You can see uh, it's a little bit bloated, I would say. It's probably the wrong word, but a little bit bloated in magenta and whatever colours are behind that right there. So the spots look to be about 30 microns across uh, on centre field, actually sharpening steadily until they reach what looks to be its smallest spots or across the whole test range at about 18.4 millimeters away from center um, when it's kind of reached its best focus for this degree of field flatness um, which is fair enough it's not something totally uncommon by the way that you'd see sometimes spots in the center being slightly larger than spots a little bit away from center uh, especially with Petzval telescopes that is I should point that out um, but Equally, you know, it's, it's reasonably large sized spots, but I'm sure it can do the business when paired with a, uh, you know, a correct sampling ratio camera. Now, the disclaimer as well, right here, um, I notice a few William Optics scopes have this tension screw disclaimer talking about, you know, if you over tighten um, the tension screw, that could cause damage. That's fine. But this one has got the extra little bit of disclaimer right here talking about due to the nature of the Minicat's fast aperture optical design. Edge stars may not be as round as with other red cats. Fair enough. However, our tests show it still outperforms conventional lenses. Now, I do have a little bit of a, a question to raise with that one. Um, obviously, I don't have a red uh, a mini cat fifty one rather to test against something like one of the best, well, you know, most well-known astrophotography lenses out there, the, the Rokinon 135, the Samyang 135 F2. Um, but I had one of those, sco uh, those lenses, I should say, and I can tell you that when stopped down just a little bit to about F2.8, mine was really sharp across an entire APS-C-sized field of view. Um, is it sharper than this? I can't say with confidence, but I just I don't know about that one so maybe someone who has both could uh, comment down below and let me know what they think but they're similar enough that I think it's uh, it's a worthy comparison to be made given that one as well costs about half as much as the other 
Um, you can see it's a six element pets valve. So clearly a lot of thought has gone into the optical design too, which equally also <laughs> makes me raise the question further as, as to why it is that it's requiring, um, you know, to get the best out of it, software. It just seems very, very odd to me. Now, I, like I said, I'm in two minds. If this is just a one-off telescope design and we don't see really any more like this, or it's just fringe cases um, where a scope is so kind of freakish, if you will, uh, in its wideness and speed, etc., that it requires that little caveat adding to the end, then fair enough, that's fine. But I wouldn't want it to be a uh, kind of a herald of things to come and where we're going to see more and more telescopes like this, where they just choose to do the best they reasonably can with the design, it seems like. Obviously, I'm, <laughs> I'm no optical scientist. I don't know what William Optics have done with this. But then rely on Blur Exterminator or similar. So it's, it's just a very... It's a troubling release to me overall. As much as I'd love one of these telescopes, I would at the same time have trouble probably spending my own money on it. Um, knowing that, you know, they, they themselves know it's not perfect. Uh, hence why bother putting, you know, the disclaimers out there and, you know, they've been very honest about it. Why bother putting together all these as well? You know, the comparisons before processing, after processing, where among all the other changes that's occurred, this is far more than just BXT has been applied by the looks of things. There's a lot of contrast, color, saturation, etc. processing going on. Uh, but you can see among the rest of the processing, large star profiles with blue fringing, nice tight star profiles, much less blue fringing. Why have the ball is together? I don't know. Does, is it all just one big disclaimer to, uh, to you know, to pre-warn someone before they drop $900 on this thing uh, that you are going to need that tool, which fine, like I say, someone in that position probably has that tool. But equally, um, is everybody going to check this page? I don't know. Is it going to catch some people out who expected, you know, the red cat name, which carries a lot of weight, I think, uh, to be synonymous with pretty much a perfect pets val telescope, which I feel like my, you know, the red cat that we have here is the red cat 51 is a very good little telescope, uh, for its size. It's phenomenal. I would say. I wouldn't call this uncorrected phenomenal. I'd say it's good, um, good to decent. After correction, it's great, but <laughs> you know, then you're relying on software to correct optical flaws. Once again, it's like I say, for me, here's my final thoughts on it. It leaves me seriously in two minds because as I've said, I think you, if you're in so deep that you're spending $900 on a telescope like this, you're probably almost certainly going to have the tools to sort out any problems, really, that you're going to find. Should you necessarily have to rely on those tools, though? I really don't think so. No. But is it as much of a problem as it kind of in my heart of hearts sort of feels like it could be? I don't know. I don't have one of these scopes to test with. I'd love to take a look at one someday if someone, you know, manufacturer sees this or whatever and wants to send one out for a review. I'd be more than happy to take a look and give it a fair, fair swing of the bat. Um, but yeah, overall, very interesting little telescope. Very interesting little notes about it there. Kudos to William Optics for being really honest about it as well. Uh, it's not like they're trying to <laughs> just, you know, slip these out of the door uh, and then say, well, you should have read that you needed BXT down in Article 47, Section B. It's right there. You know what I mean? On the front. So, um, yeah. It's an odd one. Let me know what you guys think about it. I really would like to hear if this is something you even give a damn about you know what i mean are you just like well i'm gonna use bxt on it anyway so what's the problem <laughs> which i cannot i can agree with to a degree uh or is it a major issue for you in which case i would say i'd love to hear also maybe make a point of contacting william optics about this too and let them know you know if it's something that absolutely unequivocally puts you off buying any telescope where this is a feature of the marketing uh maybe let them know before they spend any you know time and money 
on further research and development into uh, more scopes like this, if that's even a thing they're going to do. I don't know. I'm not William Optics. But uh, yeah, anyway, there it is. Thanks very much for watching. Thanks for listening to me rambling. And if you enjoyed this kind of uh, little mini dive into a subject, let me know. Uh, leave a like if you enjoyed. And until next time, look after yourselves and clear skies.